are more than 100 unique styles of beer, each with their own set of ingredients, process, guidelines, history, and experience. If you're a beer lover, an industry leader, or somewhere in between, a better knowledge of beer style will improve your life and your work. Welcome to A Sense of Beer Style, essential beer style training for those who want to lead in food and beverage. I'm Julia Herz. And I'm Jeremy Storden. We're advanced Cicerones, beer judges, home brewers, and we're excited to guide you through the vast and wonderful world of beer styles. Welcome to this incredible episode on one of my favorite, favorite beer styles, part of the uh, the breadth of an amazing category of beer styles and beer judge certification programs, the strong European beer category. And we are talking Doppelbach today. Oh, yeah. Bring it. And I've got two to try. They're actually not classic examples, but I'm going to dabble in both. And Jeremy, for those listeners, um, and you can round anything out I'm sharing, you know, Doppelbach is an easy way um, to kind of put your head in the game of two keywords uh, for students of, you know, language. Doppel means double. Bach certainly has uh, notes to a um, certain animal that you might see on the labels. Um, and on the neck of many of these examples. And if you have the Doppelbach, what you're drinking is what monks, Italian monks in Germany in the 1700s, my goodness, were drinking as liquid bread. Did I just say that? To Mm -hmm. get themselves through Lent? They were allowed to fast as part of their practice, but while they're fasting, they are drinking Doppelbach and brewing Doppelbach. So, you know, originating from the Munich area of Germany, Uh, And then taking the world by storm, I got to say that there's many variant styles of a Doppelbach, um, but this liquid bread really is a great example of malt in a glass that has been fermented, that is not hop centric, that is classic German influence. Um, But but gosh, love you, you know, from Italian monks who who no less taught us all about it. You'll also see the name of commercial examples when we talk about that of the a tour, right? There's names and there's a way to kind of start to understand. It's a Doppelbach. It's not a Bach. It's not an ice Bach. Those are other styles and a variant. But to me, the Doppelbach is is one of the base styles and, and really, really worth getting to know. Um, with that eloquent, hopefully, uh, introduction, give us some uh, classic ingredients and any other history that you want to share. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, I've got a million favorite beers. This is one of them, of course. Uh, but I, I do have to say that uh, I, I'm a beer nerd enough that for all of my beer nerd friends, when I instead of just saying, hey, uh, let's go have a beer, I say, hey, let's go fast like German monks. Uh, and that that's just code for like, hey, let's go get some liquid bread. Uh, and, and that's really what the Doppelbach, um, was created for, was for fasting monks. And, and, and that's where that liquid bread came from. So we, we talk about beer being liquid bread and it's absolutely true, but it's the Doppelbach that started it all. Um, so the, the ingredients that we expect for this, oh God, look at that. That's a beautiful beer. Um, and shame on me for not going out and getting a sample for this video. I'm going to have to go out and get one after the fact. Um, the ingredients you can expect, uh, you, this is not, uh, a, a surprising, uh, ingredient, uh, grist, uh, for this, this beer. You have a base of pills, you have a base of Munich, maybe you have a, a base of uh, Vienna or a combination thereof. Uh, maybe you have some, uh, darker malts, uh, just to kind of adjust the color, um, maybe add a little bit more because it is stronger. Maybe you're just trying to add a little bit more, um, diastatic power, a little bit more, of uh, uh, you know, uh, sugar in there to really get the ABV up. Um, so that's really where they're creating this grist of, of kind of the usual suspects for a uh, German beer like this. Still, you're going to have, uh, excuse me, you're going to have some noble hops in there, but this is, this is, you know, classic definition of a malt driven style. The hops are there to make sure it's not too sweet. Um, if you taste any hops in this, Hey, good on you. But, uh, that's not what this beer style is about. You're still going to have a clean lager yeast in there as well. But when I think of decoction mashing, I really, I mean, there's a lot of uh, beer styles that use decoction mashing, but the, the beers that I think about when I think decoction, of course, the, the Czech styles, cause they're, they're all about decoction, but this one as well, you have to, uh, do the decoction mashing of pulling a portion of the liquid out, boiling it rendering it, uh, uh, the enzymes ineffective, but you're also 
creating those Maillard flavors and developing this color and this deep, elegant flavor and pouring that back in, doing it again, doing it again. This is the heart of this beer style is that decoction mashing technique. Um, so uh, since you have the glasses out, uh, you get to talk about appearance today. I'm going to talk appearance. You've been seeing the two versions. And Jeremy mentions Maillard reaction, which is literally mentioned in the style guidelines too. Mm -hmm. That's a, a kind of a, um, a browning process when things are cooked. We're going to do or already have, if you're listening to this late enough in the journey, um, a, a prepisode on Maillard reaction and melanoidins. So stay tuned on that or look it up because it's super fun to kind of get into the chemistry. But to keep things kind of higher level, we're talking about um, Doppelbach. In the appearance, there's paler versions and there's darker versions, right? And you can notice the difference in my two, but the style guidelines will always emphasize good clarity, which I love, um, a good clear beer, especially as intended. Um, dark, creamy, persistent head, collar of foam, my example is not, it's falling flat on that. Collar of foam, I'm gonna top this one off, means that it's got a white collar of foam that clings to the side of the glass and every time you're sipping it, you're actually seeing one of those rings that indicates the amount that you consumed on each sip. Um, so, uh, you know, paler or darker, just don't be militant about it. And then the ruby highlights, both of mm -hmm. them do have, if you're looking at it, a little bit of red ruby highlights. Um, and the color of foam on both of these is not white, it's tan. And there's a reason for that. It has to do with the malt that's added. And that's always a clue on some of the, um, the malt that's been added. Let's talk about the aroma while I smell and sip it while you are talking. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Uh, if I can, I'm going to add one little little thing from my experience on the appearance. Um, you know, because you know Julia is showing two different beers. One has a good solid foam head on it, and the other one does not. That's totally normal. Uh, you can have some uh, a great foam uh, on this beer, but it's totally normal to not have beer. Why? Because a, a stronger alcohol kind of helps uh, prevent that oftentimes. And so if this is a stronger version of a Doppelbach, then you may not get that uh, head development. Um, the other thing too, you can look at in, in the wine world, they talk about, you know, holding the, the wine on its side and then looking at the legs as it, as it draws down the glass. That's another thing. This style is fantastic for looking at the quote unquote legs as it drips down the side of the glass. And a lot of that has to do with the viscosity uh, of the beers as well. And so you can look at these things and take note and try to put them together as clues, especially if you're testing for the style. Uh, it, you know, we'll talk about the aroma in just a second, but these are the things that you need to look at, pay attention to when you're trying to determine whether it's this or that. And then, so to the aroma, uh, this is a very high malt driven style. Um, you should get at the most very low hops um, uh, when, when you're just trying to uh, smell this. Uh, but you can get lots of, uh, depending if it's pale or dark, let's just talk about generalities now. You can get this just deep, elegant, rich, caramelly breadiness out of it. And you can get uh, this wonderful little alcohol uh, pop in the uh, aroma as well. And for me, it comes across as being very pepperminty. Um, and just a little bit of, just a little bit of, uh, it feels like a little bit of heat in my, in my nostril. Um, but now we're talking about, we've got pale versions and we have dark versions. And so you can think about the color and the flavor uh, uh, are, are going to kind of coordinate with each other when it comes to that. Um, uh, so when in the pale version, it's still going to be rich. It's still going to be strong. It's going to be toasty and all these wonderful flavors you expect from these pale malts. Uh, but the dark versions, um, you're going to get more of those Maillard flavors, more caramel, more, uh, even dark dried fruit really comes across particularly in the, in the darker versions. But these beers, should never be roasted, should never be uh, burnt, should never be harsh. These are deep, strong, brooding, malty beers, and they're just lovely. Julia, how are they tasting for you over there? Well, the aroma always falls into the flavor and on those dark fruits, especially in the lighter one, but that's still darker. Um, we, I, I do get that essence of kind of almost dark grapes or like overripe plums, very, very subtle. Style guidelines even mention in an aroma of going to um, fruit leather. 
That's a really good descriptor. Yeah, and that all takes me to the flavor. I mean, you talked about it, Jeremy. It's first and foremost rich and malty, right? The hop bitterness can be um, moderate to moderately low. Both versions, although it's a 2% alcohol difference in the lighter one that I'm having, which is 10% compared to the darker one, um, I'm not getting a lot of uh, bitterness, right? So it's really moderately low, but it can be moderate. And, um, you know, faint hop floral aroma is optional. That's not what's going on in either of these examples. I will also say people lay down their Doppelbox, never mind while they're the brewer is fermenting it, right? Lager means to lay down. But these are beers that do cellar pretty well. And so the more you cellar them, the less chance you're going to have for any essence of noble hops in the flavor um, or aroma. And then we've got, you know, that sweet um, essence, a higher final gravity. We'll talk about the, uh, the vitals in a minute, but definitely, you know, this is a rich beer that's going to back up sweetness that can be with, you know, deep and I'm jumping ahead, but, you know, duck dishes and lots of brown sauce oh, um, types of dishes yep. because it can stand up to it, not just because of the ethanol intensity, but because of the residual sugar. So that's a part of the um the the profile but you should notice attenuation you should notice that the sugar was fermented by the yeast um and then speaking of yeast clean fermentation lager profile you're not getting a big essence of lager uh that's just not necessary but this is a style believe it or not when i studied and um i was surprised by it the style guidelines and the darker versions allow for and almost like ester profiles right and so that is surprising because ester um profiles usually are a byproduct from ale yeast, not lager yeast, but I think the malt almost induces this essence of esters and those dark plums or grapes and the like. Um, and yeah, I mean, so mouthfeel, what do you, what do you got to add um, to uh, the story here on mouthfeel? Oh, you know, it, it's been a while uh, that we've been able to talk about beers that have a fuller, fuller body. This is one of the fullest bodied beers you can have with uh but with until we get to those aged extra strong beers, but I mean this one, the a double box are typically a, a medium full to a full body. I have had some that I would characterize as a medium body. They're still delicious. They're just a little bit lighter on the palate, but these typically have a lot of viscosity on them, partly because of the amount of malt, partly because of that decoction that we talked about. But you also have uh, part of it is that medium low to medium carbonation that also gives an impression of being fuller that that there's fewer air bubbles to lighten the load on your palate. So so the, all that malt just really concentrates on there. Um, this should always be smooth. It should be elegant. Uh, it should feel like like silk on your tongue. Um, it's once again, never harsh. There should be no astringency. But that's where we we kind of talked about alcohol. You um, you can taste alcohol, you can smell alcohol, and you can feel alcohol. And that's where you taste it; and it just feels warm. There's just like a distinct, subtle little heat uh, that kind of occurs in your mouth, and that is a, a a good indicator that you have a stronger beer. That is totally normal for a a beer like this. Um, but speaking like uh, as a beer like this. What what are these beers like? What are t talk to me about the style comparisons? So we've got a great show on Dunkel Dunkelsbach, and so there's Dunkelsbach mm -hmm. and Hellesbach, which are basically color centric examples of a lighter version of a Doppelbach, right? So this Doppelbach is stronger, richer, more hardy, and full bodied than a Dunkelsbach or a Hellesbach. Um, and then you've got paler, um, you know, examples within the, its own style will give you, um, at least on the style guidelines, uh, the indication that there's been more attenuation um, and less fruitiness um, than the darker versions. So it's almost like because there's a darker version and a lighter version within Doppelbach style, that there's two styles all baked in there. But this is not a Bach beer, whether it's Dunkel's or Helles. This is a Doppelbach. Always remember that. And then it, style guidelines don't even mention it, but Icebach, which is certainly in the same category, will I can't wait to try one of my examples <laughs> for that, is another one. And I've, I've been fooled. I mean, if you're looking at Icebach, they're, they're certainly even more smooth, more lagered, more dense and heavy. Um, but that's a style comparison that I would absolutely, if you have one in the fridge and you're tasting a Doppelbach, give yourself a chance to try that next to what the um, what the Icebach and the Doppelbach are all about. 
Um, yeah. And then commercial examples. These are some of the fun ones and easier to find. Jeremy, talk yeah. us through that. Um, yeah. And just a quick note, uh, you know, it's funny to see these beers exist on a continuum going from Bach to Doppelbach to Eisbach and, and everything between. And I can't wait when we finally do talk about Eisbach, about how you can make your own at home. And it's a really uh, exciting thing to try that anyone can try like today without having to brew your own. But we'll talk about that uh, another time. Uh, commercial examples. I have to admit um, where I have been and where I have looked for better beers, uh, I haven't always found a pale uh, doppel box. I mean, yes, I found them, but they're not quite as easy. Um, some of the pale ones that, uh, you're, that end up on the, uh, on the guidelines, we've got the Eggenberg, Yerbach, uh, Meinl Doppelbach, Hell, Plank, Bavarian, Heller, uh, the Doppelbach, um, and Rigel, Aris 19. You know, a lot of these beers, when you hear, see Doppelbach, it's going to be clear. It's just trying to de decipher whether it's, uh, pale or not. That's the hard part. Uh, one that's not on this list, but one I've had many, many, many times, and almost every time it's been sublime, is a uh, Dragon Lady. And if uh, I want to say it's from Poland, but I'm not 100% certain on that. Um, that is a fantastic, fairly easy to find pale version uh, that I found numerous times. And it, it you've got to try it. It's killer. But the, let's get into the dark ones. These are the ones that uh, when we say Doppelbach, most people think about. Um, one of my absolute favorites that takes me to uh, flavor heaven every time is the Ondex Doppelbach Dunkel. It is, it is uh, elegant. It is rich. It is, um, it is joy in a glass as far as I'm concerned. The uh, Ianger uh, Celebrator and, of course, the original, the Polliner Salvatore. Uh, one thing we didn't really mention before is that, especially with these dark uh, commercial examples, if you look for that uh, that suffix A-T-O-R, A-T-O-R, that is usually uh, the very first, the Polliner Salvatore decided to use that. They were monks, so the the uh, the uh, savior uh, is kind of how that translates. And and so subsequently, other Doppelbox would use that A-T-O-R uh, kind of uh, suffix in honor of that. And so... There are a lot of people that like Trog's Troganator is, is one that you'll uh, find as well, just to kind of honor that tradition. So those are some of the things you can find. Uh, another favorite of mine that does not follow that would be the Weinstefaner Corbinian. Um, uh, that that does not follow that uh, kind of uh, naming game, but but it's still a delightful beer to go with. Ryan Steffner can do whatever they want. <laughs> they can do whatever they plus want. Plus year old brewery yeah, there. They're not, they're not chasing trends, except they are in this say, this instance, admitting a trend and rolling that into their repertoire. Since they, as one of the most established breweries that's still in production, did not establish this style. So I love that Vine Steffner has a Doppelbach in the mix. Um, but Paul Lanner is really, you know, the ones yeah. that did start. They're like, I see what you kids are doing over there. We want in. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right? Totally. That's what happened. So now we're at that point of our uh, style cast that we get to talk about numbers. Julia, would you take us through the numbers? Absolutely. So if you're still hanging with us and we thank you for being here, we're talking about yeah. strong European beer and Doppelbach. And so that means if you're studying or uh, you know, serving these beers, buying these beers for retail, writing about these beers in whatever fashion, brewing them. The vitals matter. Um, and original gravity is always a great place to start. It's a wide range with the number two is a kind of trigger to me. 1072 to 1112. Wow. What a yes. wild original gravity. Um, that's going to indicate double digits um, even of alcohol level. But then the final gravity is not so sweet on some versions. 1016 is a reasonable final gravity to indicate that you're not going to have so much residual sugar. But final gravity isn't just starting at 1016, it ends at 1024. So again, that's a pretty big range. The ABB then lands it on average 7% to 10%. Um, I would say that's a very reasonable range. Let's remember that most wines these days, especially the reds, are 13, 14% if you're drinking California beefy reds. Um, so it's not knock you on your pants, but there's enough residual sugar where if you have several of them, you might not feel so good the next day because you've absorbed a lot of sugar. So it's a great beer um, with food that we'll get into in a minute. And then international bitterness units are lower, really not, you know, the backup band kind of version, 10 or 16 to 26. 
Uh, so that's just to give you an essence of discernible bitterness to actually try to round out some of that residual sugar and final gravity. And then the SRM, which um, we spent a lot of time talking about, is a super broad range. You're talking six SRM and zero obviously is the lowest but doesn't exist. Um, two to three is super pale and straw for SRM. Six is gold. The range for Doppelbox, believe it or not, is six SRM starting at gold yep. all the way to 25, which takes you to more red ruby browns and leading towards um, that higher level 30 to 40 would be darker towards um, light uh, dark brown or light black, I guess you'd say. Yeah. So 6 to 25, that's the biggest range if you're studying beer judge certification style guidelines, trivia people, of any SRM and quiz me or, or forgive me, tell me if I'm off on my game. Um, but that SRM range is an easy one to remember because it's such a broad range for that Hellas or dark version of Doppelbach. 6 to 25 SRM, pretty wild there. Yeah. Um, and I love, I love kind of dialing into those style guidelines because uh, the, the vitals, I mean, because that helps me ground myself and it is an easier style to wrap your brain around because some things are certainly indicative of uh, off the charge type of stuff. So glassware, Jeremy, and temperature, what what do you got? Well, you know, if it's OK, I want to go back just a real, uh, real quick because sure. uh, I had fun studying this one and trying to memorize these numbers because I don't memorize numbers. Um, not when there's too many numbers. This one, I, I figured out the pattern. When you look at the Hellesbach or the Dunkelsbach for ABV, it's roughly 6.3 to 7.3, um, you know, within like a point, uh, uh, like a tenth or, or so. This one, because it's a Doppelbach, is a little bit bigger to a lot of bit bigger. But you're probably not going to find this style of beer at a 7.11. So for that's how I remembered it was from 7 to 10 ABV. Um, Love it. And same thing with all the, the German base beers were like right for their IBUs were like 20 to 30. This one is so much more malt forward and malt focused that for me, that shifted the IBUs, the same kind of IBU pattern, but it shifted down five points. So that's how I got, you know, 15 to 25 is what I remember. These, of course, are 16 to 26. Um, so these were little, little stories, little games that I used to help me memorize this stuff. And so if that helps you listening, then, then great. Um, so let's talk about the glassware. Um, you know, uh, it's funny, you know, uh, according to like Cicerone, you know, you can find, uh, uh, this type of beer in like a Willie Becker, maybe a Pilsner, uh, if it's at 7%, yeah, no problem. I'll, I'll do a Willie Becker that. Um, I probably just have one and then go home. But if we're talking about that 10% uh, beer, you know, honestly, I want that in something a little bit more like a snifter. Um, uh, I want it in maybe like a little bit of flute glass because I'm going to sit, I'm going to brood, I'm going to enjoy this experience, to be perfectly honest. And as, when it comes to temperature, we're going to pull this out of our fridge that's so going to be under 41 degrees that is far, far too cold for this beer. I want this at least above 45 personally. I want this closer to uh, 50 and it's going to have a lot more stories to tell personally. How about you, Julia? Yep. I think those are great suggestions. The Belgian tulip uh, also too will concentrate some of the flavors, yeah. serve as that snifter, but not be as short and stout. Um, and I definitely like 45 or above. You'll find that trend with me and that's how I serve most of my beers as long as they're, uh, you know, ale or bigger lagers. Yeah. And then pair, pairing to me, I mean, this, this, this is one of the beers that would bring home, I mean, any chef to, uh, to a proper respectable place to say, we're going to give you an easy game to play, chef. Mm -hmm. Please pair a Doppelbach with one of your favorite dishes. You're going to get 20 different answers from 20 different chefs. But I mentioned the rich duck dish earlier. Um, you've also got the polar opposite of duck dishes going really well with um, Flanders style beers on the acidic level. But Doppelbach, it almost serves as the sauce as that duck dish, right? It's rich and, and, and dense, but um, you, uh, you, know, you don't have that acidity. You've got that residual sugar. So I love it with a, a, a proper duck dish. My stepmom makes an amazing one and I, I makes me want to bring... Bring um, a Doppelbach to a uh, Christmas Eve dinner because I've never yep. done that from her duck. It takes her two days to cook it. Um, the other essence of, uh, you know, on the on the sweet side is German chocolate cake. I think would really fall into this beer. When you pair, you want to match intensities. You can go up the charts and 
and do really um, subtle compared and paired against uh, really heavy and dense, but they're gonna wash each other out. I think uh, with a German chocolate cake, this beer would be incredible. And then it also begs, you know, certain mi uh, meats and, and respect to the vegetarians and vegans out there, but you know, pork or ham, my goodness, like bring me home, serve me a Doppelbach, um, you know, prepare that pork or ham in a way that is going to uh, either have barbecue sauce on it or be stewed or give me some corned beef um, and, mm. you know, a Canarsie sandwich from kind of Brooklyn, New York. And like, I could just go on and on, put some, uh, put it with some rye bread, give it a little spiciness. Um, I love the essence of maybe um, Canarsie sandwiches have corned beef, they have Swiss cheese melted on them. They also put on the sandwich, uh, you know, a real creamy compliment uh, of uh, coleslaw. And I love the idea of potentially trying this with that creamy coleslaw to see what this beer can do to that and kind of give it a brown malt sauce over that coleslaw. So I'm, yeah. I'm going on and on. What, oh, do, you, gosh, what are you thinking? Because this is such a fun beer to pair with. Um, but, you know, always the, the first thing we need to do when we think about pairing is match intensities. This is especially particularly true for this beer because it is such a big beer with bold flavors. So you, it, it will let you know if you missed it uh, pretty quickly or not. Um, you know, when I think about a beer like this, you know, I, I want a, like an elk steak and not a real gamey one, not like an elk bull, maybe like an elk cow. So it's just a little bit softer, like but it. still kind of earthy. Um, and just, and let the flavors of the meat really come out, maybe a little salt, pepper, and maybe that's about it. But this beer I think would be spectacular with that. Um, a big one, uh, you know, uh, at some point we're going to hit uh, Thanksgiving. This is a fantastic beer for Thanksgiving. Just general statement. Don't need to dive in any further detail. You know what I'm talking about. Um, yeah, I do. I would put Belgian Triple, Belgian <laughs> Golden Strong, and Doppelbach as three of the top beers to have at Thanksgiving. For Thanksgiving, today. yeah. But uh, one other dish, when I was thinking about this, I thought, you know, I, I think this would be great because there's, you know, we think about the... Um, the uh, uh, comparing uh, or uh, contrasting flavors and complementing flavors. But then there's kind of like a secondary tertiary uh, kind of relation that exists there too. And, and I think about like cherries and cherry pie and how this beer kind of can kind of take that pie uh, role. And so you can add cherries to something like a, uh, I, I once had a pan seared, um, rack of lamb that was finished in the oven and had this uh, cherry gastrique with just a little bit of uh, mint infused into it. And I think a beer like this could kind of cause that bridge through uh, through relationship of when you think cherry, you think cherry pie, the beer is, becomes the pie and you get this wonderful, wonderful meat. I think that would be a spectacular pairing. And if not, and I'm still going to try it. No, you're, you're on the money and you bring you back to a duck dish where a common um, sauce yep. on that is a cherry sauce. Yep. And so the Doppelbach can bring to the table some of that essence and elicit the notion of those wild plums, dark, you know, grapefruits, mm. uh, not grapefruit, but darker red fruits that are grapes and, um, and yeah, and cherries. Yeah. So especially, I love it. Especially playing off those dark dried fruit flavors that can often end up in a darker version of a Doppelbach. It's like, it's so, it's it, it just... Fish in a barrel pairing with this beer, yeah. as long as you get the intensities right. Thanks for joining us, Sense of Beer Style. You can tell we like Doppelbox. <laughs> um, keep listening. We love hearing from you, and be well. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you for listening to A Sense of Beer Style, the essential beer style training for those who want to lead in food and beverage. With advanced Cicerones, me, Julia. And me, Jeremy. Tune into the next episode as we continue exploring the world of beer styles and what to make of them. We encourage you to listen to the prepisodes to build your foundation and better understand beer styles. And before the next episode, I'd like to ask you to review the show and let us know what you'd like featured in upcoming episodes. Until next time, here's to you and your sense of beer style. Thank you for listening. Cheers. Cheers.